Forward and Chapter One of The Path of Prosperity by James Allen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Path of Prosperity by James Allen. Forward. I looked around upon the world and saw that it was shadowed by sorrow, and scorched by the fierce fires of suffering. And I looked for the cause. I looked around, but could not find it. I looked in books, but could not find it. I looked within, and found there both the cause and the self-made nature of that cause. I looked again, and deeper, and found the remedy. I found one law, the law of love, one life, the life of adjustment to that law, one truth, the truth of a conquered mind and a quiet and obedient heart. And I dreamed of writing a book which should help men and women, whether rich or poor, learned or unlearned, worldly or unworldly, to find within themselves the source of all success, all happiness, all accomplishment, all truth. And the dream remained with me, and at last became substantial, and now I send it forth into the world on its mission of healing and blessedness, knowing that it cannot fail to reach the homes and hearts of those who are waiting and ready to receive it. James Allen Chapter 1 The Lesson of Evil Unrest and pain and sorrow are the shadows of life. There is no heart in all the world that has not felt the sting of pain, no mind that has not been tossed upon the dark waters of trouble, no eye that has not wept the hot blinding tears of unspeakable anguish. There is no household where the great destroyers, disease and death, have not entered severing heart from heart, and casting over all the dark pall of sorrow. In the strong and apparently indestructible meshes of evil, all are more or less fast caught, and pain, unhappiness, and misfortune wait upon mankind. With the object of escaping, or in some way mitigating the overshadowing gloom, Men and women rush blindly into innumerable devices, pathways by which they fondly hope to enter into a happiness which will not pass away. Such are the drunkard and the harlot who revel in sensual excitements. Such is the exclusive esthete who shuts himself out from the sorrows of the world and surrounds himself with enervating luxuries. Such is he who thirsts for wealth or fame and subordinates all things to the achievement of that object. And such are they who seek consolation in the performance of religious rites. And to all the happiness sought seems to come, and the soul, for a time, is lulled into a sweet security and an intoxicating forgetfulness of the existence of evil. But the day of disease comes at last, or some great sorrow, temptation, or misfortune, breaks suddenly in on the unfortified soul, and the fabric of its fancied happiness is torn to shreds. So over the head of every personal joy hangs the Democletian sword of pain, ready at any moment to fall and crush the soul of him who is unprotected by knowledge. The child cries to be a man or woman, the man and woman sigh for the lost felicity of childhood. The poor man chafes under the chains of poverty by which he is bound, and the rich man often lives in the fear of poverty, or scours the world in search of an elusive shadow he calls happiness. Sometimes the soul feels that it has found a secure peace and happiness in adopting a certain religion, in embracing an intellectual philosophy or in building up an intellectual or artistic ideal, but some overpowering temptation 
proves the religion to be inadequate or insufficient. The theoretical philosophy is found to be a useless prop. Or in a moment, the idealistic statue, upon which the devotee has for years been laboring, is shattered into fragments at his feet. Is there, then, no way of escape from pain and sorrow? Are there no means by which bonds of evil may be broken? Is permanent happiness, secure prosperity, and abiding peace a foolish dream? No, there is a way, and I speak it with gladness, by which evil can be slain forever. There is a process by which disease, poverty, or any adverse condition or circumstance can be put on one side, never to return. There is a method by which a permanent prosperity can be secured, free from all fear of the return of adversity, and there is a practice by which unbroken and unending peace and bliss can be partaken of and realized. And the beginning of the way which leads to this glorious realization is the acquirement of a right understanding of the nature of evil. It is not sufficient to deny or ignore evil. It must be understood. It is not enough to pray to God to remove the evil. You must find out why it is there and what lesson it has for you. It is of no avail to fret and fume and chafe at the chains which bind you. You must know why and how you are bound. Therefore, reader, you must get outside yourself and must begin to examine and understand yourself. You must cease to be a disobedient child in the school of experience and must begin to learn with humility and patience the lessons that are set for your edification and ultimate perfection. For evil, when rightly understood, is found to be not an unlimited power or principle in the universe, but a passing phase of human experience, and it therefore becomes a teacher to those who are willing to learn. Evil is not an abstract something outside yourself. It is an experience in your own heart, and by patiently examining and rectifying your heart, you will be gradually led into the discovery of the origin and nature of evil, which will necessarily be followed by its complete eradication. All evil is corrective and remedial, and is therefore not permanent. It is rooted in ignorance, ignorance of the true nature and relation of things, and so long as we remain in that state of ignorance, we remain subject to evil. There is no evil in the universe which is not the result of ignorance, and which would not, if we were ready and willing to learn its lesson, lead us to higher wisdom, and then vanish away. But men remain in evil, and it does not pass away, because men are not willing or prepared to learn the lesson which it came to teach them. I knew a child who, every night when its mother took it to bed, cried to be allowed to play with the candle, and one night, when the mother was off guard for a moment, the child took hold of the candle. The inevitable result followed, and the child never wished to play with the candle again. By its one foolish act it learned, and learned perfectly, the lesson of obedience, and entered into the knowledge that fire burns. And this incident is a complete illustration of the nature, meaning, and ultimate result of all sin and evil. As the child suffered through its own ignorance of the real nature of fire, so older children suffer through their ignorance of the real nature of the things which they weep for and strive after, and which harm them when they are secured, the only difference being that in the latter case the ignorance and evil are more deeply rooted and obscure. Evil has always been symbolized by darkness and good by light and hidden within the symbol is contained the perfect interpretation, the reality, for just as light always floods the universe, and darkness is only a mere speck or shadow cast by a small body intercepting a few rays of the illimitable light, so the light of the supreme good is the positive and life-giving power which floods the universe, and evil, the insignificant shadow cast by the self, 
that intercepts and shuts off the illuminating rays which strive for entrance. When night folds the world in its black impenetrable mantle, no matter how dense the darkness, it covers but the small space of half our little planet, while the whole universe is ablaze with living light, and every soul knows that it will awake in the light in the morning. Know then that when the dark night of sorrow, pain or misfortune, settles down upon your soul, and you stumble along with weary and uncertain steps, that you are merely intercepting your own personal desires between yourself and the boundless light of joy and bliss, and the dark shadow that covers you is cast by none and nothing but yourself. And just as the darkness without is but a negative shadow, an unreality which comes from nowhere, goes to nowhere, and has no abiding dwelling place, so the darkness within is equally a negative shadow, passing over the evolving and light-born soul. But, I fancy I hear someone say, why pass through the darkness of evil at all? Because, by ignorance you have chosen to do so, and because by doing so, you may understand both good and evil, and may the more appreciate the light by having passed through the darkness. As evil is the direct outcome of ignorance, so when the lessons of evil are fully learned, ignorance passes away, and wisdom takes its place. But as a disobedient child refuses to learn its lessons at school, so it is possible to refuse to learn the lessons of experience, and thus to remain in continual darkness, and to suffer continually recurring punishments, in the form of disease, disappointment, and sorrow. He, therefore, who would shake himself free of the evil which encompasses him, must be willing and ready to learn, and must be prepared to undergo that disciplinary process, without which no grain of wisdom or abiding happiness and peace can be secured. A man may shut himself up in a dark room, and deny that the light exists, but it is everywhere without, and darkness exists only in his own little room. So you may shut out the light of truth, or you may begin to pull down the walls of prejudice, self-seeking, and error, which you have built around yourself, and so let in the glorious and omnipresent light. By earnest self-examination, strive to realize, and not merely hold as a theory, that evil is a passing phase, a self-created shadow, that all your pains, sorrows, and misfortunes have come to you by a process of undeviating and absolutely perfect law, have come to you because you deserve and require them, and that by first enduring and then understanding them, you may be made stronger, wiser, nobler. When you have fully entered into this realization, you will be in a position to mold your own circumstances, to transmute all evil into good, and to weave, with a master hand, the fabric of your destiny. What of the night, O watchman, seest thou yet the glimmering dawn upon the mountain heights, the golden herald of the light of lights? Are his fair feet upon the hilltops set? Cometh he yet to chase away the gloom, and with it all the demons of the night? Strike yet his darting rays upon thy sight? Hearest thou his voice, the sound of error's doom? The morning cometh, lover of the light, Even now he gilds with gold the mountain's brow. Dimly I see the path whereon even now His shining feet are set toward the night. Darkness shall pass away, and all the things that love the darkness and that hate the light shall disappear forever with the night. Rejoice, for thus the speeding herald sings. End of Foreword and Chapter 1 Recording by Andrea Fiore Chapter 2 of The Path of Prosperity this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore 
The Path of Prosperity by James Allen Chapter 2 The World a Reflex of Mental States What you are, so is your world. Everything in the universe is resolved into your own inward experience. It matters little what is without, for it is all a reflection of your own state of consciousness. It matters everything what you are within, for everything without will be mirrored and colored accordingly. All that you positively know is contained in your own experience. All that you will ever know must pass through the gateway of experience, and so become part of yourself. Your own thoughts, desires, and aspirations comprise your world, and to you, all that there is in the universe of beauty and joy and bliss, or of ugliness and sorrow and pain, is contained within yourself. By your own thoughts you make or mar your life, your world, your universe. As you build within by the power of thought, so will your outward life and circumstances shape themselves accordingly. Whatsoever you harbor in the inmost chambers of your heart will sooner or later, by the inevitable law of reaction, shape itself in your outward life. The soul that is impure, sordid and selfish, is gravitating with unerring precision toward misfortune and catastrophe. The soul that is pure, unselfish and noble is gravitating with equal precision toward happiness and prosperity. Every soul attracts its own, and nothing can possibly come to it that does not belong to it. To realize this is to recognize the universality of divine law. The incidents of every human life, which both make and mar, are drawn to it by the quality and power of its own inner thought life. Every soul is a complex combination of gathered experiences and thoughts, and the body is but an improvised vehicle for its manifestation. What therefore your thoughts are, that is your real self, and the world around, both inanimate and inanimate, wears the aspect with which your thoughts clothe it. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. Thus said Buddha, and it therefore follows that if a man is happy, it is because he dwells in happy thoughts. If miserable, because he dwells in despondent and dehabilitating thoughts. Whether one be fearful or fearless, foolish or wise, troubled or serene, within that soul lies the cause of its own state or states, and never without. And now I seem to hear a chorus of voices exclaim, But do you really mean to say that outward circumstances do not affect our minds? I do not say that, but I say this, and know it to be an infallible truth, that circumstances can only affect you in so far as you allow them to do so. You are swayed by circumstances because you have not a right understanding of the nature, use, and power of thought. You believe, and upon this little word belief hang all our sorrows and joys, that outward things have the power to make or mar your life. By so doing you submit to those outward things, confess that you are their slave, and they are your unconditional master. By so doing you invest them with a power which they do not of themselves possess. And you succumb in reality, not to mere circumstances, but to the gloom or gladness, the fear or hope, the strength or weakness, which your thought sphere has thrown around them. I knew two men who at an early age lost the hard-earned savings of years. One was very deeply troubled and gave way to chagrin, worry, and despondency. The other, on reading in his morning paper that the bank in which his money was deposited had hopelessly failed, and that he had lost all, quietly and firmly remarked, Well, it's gone, 
and trouble and worry won't bring it back, but hard work will. He went to work with renewed vigor and rapidly became prosperous, while the former man, continuing to mourn the loss of his money and to grumble at his bad luck, remain the sport and tool of adverse circumstances, in reality of his own weak and slavish thoughts. The loss of money was a curse to the one, because he clothed the event with dark and dreary thoughts. It was a blessing to the other, because he threw around it thoughts of strength, of hope, and renewed endeavor. If circumstances had the power to bless or harm, they would bless and harm all men alike. But the fact that the same circumstances will be alike good and bad to different souls proves that the good or bad is not the circumstance, but only in the mind of him that encounters it. When you begin to realize this, you will begin to control your thoughts, to regulate and discipline your mind, and to rebuild the inward temple of your soul, eliminating all useless and superfluous material, and incorporating into your being thoughts alone of joy and serenity, of strength and life, of compassion and love, of beauty and immortality. And as you do this, you will become joyful and serene, strong and healthy, compassionate and loving, and beautiful with the beauty of immortality. As we clothe events with the drapery of our own thoughts, so likewise do we clothe the objects of the visible world around us, and where one sees harmony and beauty, another sees revolting ugliness. An enthusiastic naturalist was one day roaming the country lanes in pursuit of his hobby, and during his rambles came upon a pool of brackish water near a farmyard. As he proceeded to fill a small bottle with the water for the purpose of examination under the microscope, he dilated, with more enthusiasm than discretion, to an uncultivated son of the plow who stood close by upon the hidden and innumerable wonders contained in the pool, and concluded by saying, Yes, my friend, within this pool is contained a hundred, nay, a million universes. Had we but the sense or the instrument by which we could apprehend them? And the unsophisticated one ponderously remarked, I know the water be full of tadpoles, but they be easy to catch. When the naturalist, his mind stored with the knowledge of natural facts, saw beauty, harmony, and hidden glory, the mind unenlightened upon those things saw only an offensive mud puddle. The wild flower, which the casual wayfarer thoughtlessly tramples upon, is, to the spiritual eye of the poet, an angelic messenger from the invisible. To many, the ocean is but a dreary expanse of water on which ships sail and are sometimes wrecked. To the soul of the musician it is a living thing, and he hears, in all its changing moods, divine harmonies. Where the ordinary mind sees disaster and confusion, the mind of the philosopher sees the most perfect sequence of cause and effect, and where the materialist sees nothing but endless death, the mystic sees pulsating and eternal life. And as we clothe both events and objects with our own thoughts, so likewise do we clothe the souls of others in the garments of our thoughts. The suspicious believe everybody to be suspicious. The liar feels secure in the thought that he is not so foolish as to believe that there is such a phenomenon as a strictly truthful person. The envious see envy in every soul. The miser thinks everybody is eager to get his money. He who has subordinated conscience in the making of his wealth sleeps with a revolver under his pillow, wrapped in the delusion that the world is full of conscienceless people who are eager to rob him. And the abandoned sensualist looks upon the saint as a hypocrite. On the other hand, those who dwell in loving thoughts, 
see that all in which calls forth their love and sympathy the trusting and honest are not troubled by suspicions the good-natured and charitable who rejoice at the good fortune of others scarcely know what envy means and he who has realized the divine within himself recognizes it in all beings even in the beasts and men and women are confirmed in their mental outlook because of the fact that by the law of cause and effect they attract to themselves that which they send forth and so come in contact with people similar to themselves the old adage birds of a feather flock together has a deeper significance than is generally attached to it for in the thought world as in the world of matter each clings to its kind do you wish for kindness be kind do you ask for truth be true what you give of yourself you find your world is a reflex of you if you are one of those who are praying for and looking forward to a happier world beyond the grave here is a message of gladness for you you may enter into and realize that happy world now it fills the whole universe and it is within you waiting for you to find acknowledge and possess said one who knew the inner laws of being when men shall go here or go there go not after them the kingdom of god is within you what you have to do is believe this simply believe it with a mind unshadowed by doubt and then meditate upon it till you understand it you will then begin to purify and to build your inner world and as you proceed passing from revelation to revelation from realization to realization you will discover the utter powerlessness of outward things beside the magic potency of a self-governed soul if thou wouldst right the world and banish all its evils and its woes make its wild places bloom and its drear deserts blossom as the rose then write thyself if thou wouldst turn the world from its long lone captivity and sin restore all broken hearts slay grief and let sweet consolation in turn thou thyself if thou wouldst cure the world of its long sickness end its grief and pain bring in all healing joy and give to the afflicted rest again then cure thyself if thou wouldst wake the world out of its dream of death and darkening strife bring it to love and peace and light and brightness of immortal life wake thou thyself end of chapter 2 recording by andrea fiori chapter 3 of the path of prosperity this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by andrea fiori the path of prosperity by james allen chapter 3 the way out of undesirable conditions having seen and realized that evil is but a passing shadow thrown by the intercepting self across the transcendent form of the eternal good and that the world is a mirror in which each sees a reflection of himself we now ascend by firm and easy steps to that plane of perception whereon is seen and realized the vision of the law with this realization comes the knowledge that everything is included in a ceaseless interaction of cause and effect and that nothing can possibly be divorced from law from the most trivial thought word or act of man up to the groupings of celestial bodies law reigns supreme no arbitrary condition can even for one moment exist for such a condition would be a denial and an annihilation of law every condition of life is therefore bound up in an orderly and harmonious sequence and the secret and cause of every condition is contained within itself the law 
whatsoever a man sows that he shall also reap, is inscribed in flaming letters upon the portal of eternity, and none can deny it, none can cheat it, none can escape it. He who puts his hand in the fire must suffer the burning, until such a time as it has worked itself out, and neither curses nor prayers can avail to alter it. And precisely the same law governs the realm of mind. Hatred, anger, jealousy, envy, lust, covetousness, all these are fires which burn, and whoever even so much as touches them must suffer the torments of burning. All these conditions of mind are rightly called evil, for they are the efforts of the soul to subvert, in its ignorance, the law, and they therefore lead to chaos and confusion within, and are sooner or later actualized in the outward circumstances, as disease, failure, and misfortune, coupled with grief, pain, and despair. Whereas love, gentleness, goodwill, purity, are cooling airs which breathe peace upon the soul that woes them, and being in harmony with the eternal law, they become actualized in the form of health, peaceful surroundings, and undeviating success and good fortune. A thorough understanding of this great law, which permeates the universe, leads to the acquirement of that state of mind known as obedience. To know that justice, harmony, and love are supreme in the universe is likewise to know that all adverse and painful conditions are the result of our own disobedience to that law. Such knowledge leads to strength and power, and it is upon such knowledge alone that a true life and an enduring success and happiness can be built. To be patient under all circumstances, and to accept all conditions as necessary factors in your training, is to rise superior to all painful conditions, and to overcome them with an overcoming which is sure, and which leaves no fear of their return, for by the power of obedience to law they are utterly slain. Such an obedient one is working in harmony with the law, has in fact identified himself with the law, and whatsoever he conquers he conquers forever, whatsoever he builds can never be destroyed. The cause of all power, as of all weakness, is within. The secret of all happiness, as of all misery, is likewise within. There is no progress apart from unfoldment within, and no sure foothold of prosperity or peace, except by the orderly advancement in knowledge. You say you are chained by circumstances. You cry out for better opportunities, for a wider scope, for improved physical conditions, and perhaps you inwardly curse the fate that binds you hand and foot. It is for you that I write. It is for you that I speak. Listen and let my words burn themselves into your heart, for that which I say to you is truth. You may bring about that improved condition in your outward life which you desire, if you will unswervingly resolve to improve your inner life. I know this pathway looks barren at its commencement. Truth always does. It is only error and delusion which are at first inviting and fascinating. But if you undertake to walk it, if you perseveringly discipline your mind, eradicating your weaknesses, and allowing your soul forces and spiritual powers to unfold themselves, you will be astonished at the magical changes which will be brought about in your outward life. As you proceed, golden opportunities will be strewn across your path, and the power and judgment to properly utilize them will spring up within you. Genial friends will come unbidden to you. Sympathetic souls will be drawn to you as the needle is to the magnet, and books and all outward aids that you require will come to you unsought. Perhaps the chains of poverty hang heavily upon you, and you are friendless and alone, and you long with an intense longing that your load may be lightened, but the load continues, 
and you seem to be enveloped in an ever-increasing darkness. Perhaps you complain, you bewail your lot, your birth, your parents, your employer, or the unjust powers who have bestowed upon you so undeservedly poverty and other affluence and ease. Cease your complaining and fretting. None of these things which you blame are the cause of your poverty. The cause is within yourself, and where the cause is, there is the remedy. The very fact that you are a complainer shows that you deserve your lot, shows that you lack the faith which is the ground of all effort and progress. There is no room for a complainer in a universe of law, and worry is sole suicide. By your very attitude of mind, you are strengthening the chains which bind you, and are drawing about you the darkness by which you are enveloped. Alter your outlook upon life, and your outward life will alter. Build yourself up in the faith and knowledge, and make yourself worthy of better surroundings and wider opportunities. Be sure, first of all, that you are making the best of what you have. Do not delude yourself into supposing that you can step into greater advantages whilst overlooking smaller ones, for if you could, the advantage would be impermanent, and you would quickly fall back again in order to learn the lesson which you had neglected. As the child at school must master one standard before passing on to the next, so before you can have that greater good which you so desire, must you faithfully employ that which you already possess. The parable of the talents is a beautiful story illustrative of this truth, for does it not plainly show that if we misuse, neglect, or degrade that which we possess, be it ever so mean and insignificant, even that little will be taken from us, for by our conduct we show that we are unworthy of it. Perhaps you are living in a small cottage and are surrounded by unhealthy and vicious influences. You desire a larger and more sanitary residence. Then you must fit yourself for such a residence by first of all making your cottage, as far as possible, a little paradise. Keep it spotlessly clean. Make it look as pretty and sweet as your limited means will allow. Cook your plain food with all care and arrange your humble table as tastefully as you possibly can. If you cannot afford a carpet, let your rooms be carpeted with smiles and welcomes, fastened down with the nails of kind words, driven in with the hammer of patience. Such a carpet will not fade in the sun, and constant use will never wear it away. So by ennobling your present surroundings you will rise above them, and above the need of them, and at the right time you will pass on into a better house and surroundings which have all along been waiting for you and which you have fitted yourself to occupy perhaps you desire more time for thought and effort and feel that your hours of labor are too hard and long then see to it that you are utilizing to the fullest possible extent what little spare time you have it is useless to desire more time if you are already wasting what little you have, for you would only grow more indolent and indifferent. Even poverty and lack of time and leisure are not the only evils that you imagine they are. And if they hinder you in your progress, it is because you have clothed them in your own weaknesses, and the evil that you see them in is really in yourself. Endeavor to fully and completely realize that in so far as you shape and mold your mind, you are the maker of your destiny, and as, by the transmuting power of self-discipline, you realize this more and more, you will come to see that these so-called evils may be converted into blessings. You will then utilize your poverty for the cultivation of patience, hope, and courage, and your lack of time in the gaining of promptness of action and decision of mind, by seizing the precious moments as they present themselves for your acceptance. As in the rankest soil the most beautiful flowers are grown, so in the dark soil of poverty 
the choicest flowers of humanity have developed and bloomed. Where there are difficulties to cope with, and unsatisfactory conditions to overcome, their virtue most flourishes and manifests its glory. It may be that you are in the employ of a tyrannous master or mistress, and you feel that you are harshly treated. Look upon this also as necessary to your training. Return your employer's unkindness with gentleness and forgiveness. Practice unceasingly patience and self-control. Turn the disadvantage to account by utilizing it for the gain of mental and spiritual strength, and by your silent example and influence, you will thus be teaching your employer, will be helping him to grow ashamed of his conduct, and will, at the same time, be lifting yourself up to that height of spiritual attainment by which you will be enabled to step into new and more congenial surroundings at the time when they are presented to you. Do not complain that you are a slave, but lift yourself up by noble conduct above the plane of slavery. Before complaining that you are a slave to another, be sure that you are not a slave to self. Look within, look searchingly, and have no mercy upon yourself. You will find there, perchance, slavish thoughts, slavish desires, and in your daily life and conduct, slavish habits. Conquer these, cease to be a slave to self, and no man will have the power to enslave you. As you overcome self, you will overcome all adverse conditions, and every difficulty will fall before you. Do not complain that you are oppressed by the rich. Are you sure that if you gain these riches, you would not be an oppressor yourself? Remember that there is the eternal law, which is absolutely just, and that he who oppresses today must himself be oppressed tomorrow, and from this there is no way of escape. And perhaps you, yesterday, in some former existence, were rich and an oppressor, and that you are now merely paying off the debt which you owe to the great law. Practice, therefore, fortitude and faith. Dwell constantly in the mind upon the eternal justice, the eternal good. Endeavor to lift yourself above the personal and the transitory into the impersonal and permanent. Shake off the delusion that you are being injured or oppressed by another, and try to realize by a profounder comprehension of your inner life and the laws which govern that life, that you are only really injured by what is within you. There is no practice more degrading, debasing, and soul-destroying than that of self-pity. Cast it out from you. While such a canker is feeding upon your heart, you can never expect to grow into a fuller life. Cease from the condemnation of others and begin to condemn yourself. Condone none of your acts, desires, or thoughts that will not bear comparison with spotless purity, or endure the light of sinless good. By so doing you will be building your house upon the rock of the eternal, and all that is required for your happiness and well-being will come to you in its own time. There is positively no way of permanently rising above poverty or any undesirable condition, except by eradicating those selfish and negative conditions within, of which these are the reflection, and by virtue of which they continue. The way to true riches is to enrich the soul by the acquisition of virtue. Outside of real heart virtue, there is neither prosperity nor power, but only the appearances of these. I am aware that men make money who have acquired no measure of virtue, and have little desire to do so, but such money does not constitute true riches, and its possession is transitory and feverish. Here is David's testimony. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence. 
When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. The prosperity of the wicked was a great trial to David until he went into the sanctuary of God, and then he knew their end. You likewise may go into that sanctuary. It is within you. It is that state of consciousness which remains when all that is sordid and personal and impermanent is risen above, and universal and eternal principles are realized. That is the God state of consciousness. It is the sanctuary of the Most High. When by long strife and self-discipline you have succeeded in entering the door of that holy temple, you will perceive, with unobstructed vision, the end and fruit of all human thought and endeavor, both good and evil. You will then no longer relax your faith when you see the immoral man accumulating outward riches, for you will know that he must come again to poverty and degradation. The rich man who is barren of virtue is in reality poor, and as surely as the waters of the river are drifting to the ocean, so surely is he, in the midst of all his riches, drifting towards poverty and misfortune, and though he die rich, yet he must return to reap the bitter fruit of all his immorality. And though he become rich many times, yet as many times must he be thrown back into poverty, until by long experience and suffering he conquers the poverty within. But the man who is outwardly poor, yet rich in virtue, is truly rich, and in the midst of all his poverty he is surely traveling towards prosperity, and abounding joy and bliss await his coming. If you would be truly and permanently prosperous, you must first become virtuous. It is therefore unwise to aim directly at prosperity, to make it the one object of life, to reach out greedily for it. To do this is to ultimately defeat yourself. But rather aim at self-perfection, make useful and unselfish service the object of your life, and ever reach out hands of faith towards the supreme and unalterable good. You say you desire wealth not for your sake, but in order to do good with it and to bless others. If this is your real motive in desiring wealth, then wealth will come to you, for you are strong and unselfish indeed if in the midst of riches you are willing to look upon yourself as a steward and not as owner. But examine well your motive, for in the majority of instances where money is desired for the admitted object of blessing others, the real underlying motive is a love of popularity and a desire to pose as a philanthropist or reformer. If you are not doing good with what little you have, the more money you got the more selfish you would become, and all the good you appeared to do with your money, if you attempted to do any, would be so much insinuating self-laudation. If your real desire is to do good, there is no need to wait for money before you do it. You can do it now, this very moment, and just where you are. If you are really so unselfish as you believe yourself to be, you will show it by sacrificing yourself for others now. No matter how poor you are, there is room for self-sacrifice, for did not the widow put her all into the treasury? The heart that truly desires to do good does not wait for money before doing it, but comes to the altar of sacrifice, and leaving there the unworthy elements of self, goes out and breathes upon neighbor and stranger, friend and enemy alike, the breath of blessedness. As the effect is related to the cause, so is prosperity and power related to the inward good, and poverty and weakness to the inward evil. Money does not constitute true wealth, nor position, nor power, and to rely upon it alone is to stand upon a slippery place. Your true wealth is your stock of virtue, and your true power the uses to which you put it. Rectify your heart, and you will rectify your life. Lust, 
hatred, anger, vanity, pride, covetousness, self-indulgence, self-seeking, obstinacy, all these are poverty and weakness, whereas love, purity, gentleness, meekness, compassion, generosity, self-forgetfulness, and self-renunciation, all these are wealth and power. As the elements of poverty and weakness are overcome, an irresistible and all-conquering power is evolved from within, and he who succeeds in establishing himself in the highest virtue brings the whole world to his feet. But the rich, as well as the poor, have their undesirable conditions, and are frequently farther removed from happiness than the poor. And here we see how happiness depends, not upon outward aids or possessions, but upon the inward life. Perhaps you are an employer, and you have endless trouble with those whom you employ, and when you do get good and faithful servants, they quickly leave you. As a result you are beginning to lose, or have completely lost, your faith in human nature. You try to remedy matters by giving better wages and by allowing certain liberties, yet matters remain unaltered. Let me advise you. The secret of all your trouble is not in your servants, it is in yourself. And if you look within, with a humble and sincere desire to discover and eradicate your error, you will, sooner or later, find the origin of all your unhappiness. It may be some selfish desire, or lurking suspicion, or unkind attitude of mind, which sends out its poison upon those about you, and reacts upon yourself, even though you may not show it in your manner or speech. Think of your servants with kindness. Consider of them that extremity of service, which you yourself would not care to perform, were you in their place. Rare and beautiful is that humility of soul, by which a servant entirely forgets himself in his master's good. But far rarer and beautiful with a divine beauty is that nobility of soul, by which a man, forgetting his own happiness, seeks the happiness of those who are under his authority, and who depend upon him for their bodily sustenance. And such a man's happiness is increased tenfold, nor does he need to complain of those whom he employs. Said a well-known and extensive employer of labor, who never needs to dismiss an employee, I have always had the happiest relations with my workpeople. If you ask me how it is to be accounted for, I can only say that it has been my aim from the first to do to them as I would wish to be done by. Herein lies the secret by which all desirable conditions are secured, and all that are undesirable are overcome. Do you say that you are lonely and unloved, and have not a friend in the world? Then I pray you, for the sake of your own happiness, blame nobody but yourself. Be friendly towards others, and friends will soon flock round you. Make yourself pure and lovable, and you will be loved by all. Whatever conditions are rendering your life burdensome, you may pass out of and beyond them by developing and utilizing within you the transforming power of self-purification and self-conquest. Be at the poverty which galls, and remember that the poverty upon which I have been dilating is that poverty which is a source of misery, and not that voluntary poverty which is the glory of emancipated souls or the riches which burden, or the many misfortunes, griefs, and annoyances which form the dark background in the web of life, you may overcome them by overcoming the selfish elements within which give them life. It matters not that by the unfailing law there are past thoughts and acts to work out and to atone for, as by the same law we are setting in motion during every moment of our life, fresh thoughts and acts, and we have the power to make them good or ill. Nor does it follow that if a man, reaping what he has sown, 
must lose money or forfeit position, that he must also lose his fortitude or forfeit his uprightness, and it is in these that his wealth and power and happiness are to be found. He who clings to self is his own enemy and is surrounded by enemies. He who relinquishes self is his own savior and is surrounded by friends like a protecting belt. Before the divine radiance of a pure heart, all darkness vanishes and all clouds melt away, and he who has conquered self has conquered the universe. Come then out of your poverty, come out of your pain, come out of your troubles and sighings and complainings and heartaches and loneliness by coming out of yourself. Let the old tattered garment of your petty selfishness fall from you, and put on the new garment of universal love. You will then realize the inward heaven, and it will be reflected in all your outward life. He who sets his foot firmly upon the path of self-conquest, who walks, aided by the staff of faith, the highway of self-sacrifice, will assuredly achieve the highest prosperity and will reap abounding and enduring joy and bliss. To them that seek the highest good, all things subserve the wisest ends. Not comes as ill, and wisdom lends wings to all shapes of evil brood. The darkening sorrow veils a star that waits to shine with gladsome light. Hell waits on heaven, and after night comes golden glory from afar. Defeats are steps by which we climb with purer aim to nobler ends. Loss leads to gain and joy attends true footsteps up the hills of time. Pain leads to paths of holy bliss, to thoughts and words and deeds divine. And clouds that gloom and rays that shine along life's upward highway kiss. Misfortune does not but cloud the way whose end and summit in the sky of bright success, sun-kissed and high, awaits our seeking and our stay. The heavy pall of doubts and fears that clouds the valley of our hopes, the shades with which the spirit copes, the bitter harvesting of tears. The heartaches, miseries, and griefs, the bruisings born of broken ties, all these are steps by which we rise to living ways of sound beliefs. Love, pitying, watchful, runs to meet the pilgrim from the land of fate. All glory and all good await the coming of obedient feet. End of chapter 3 Recording by Andrea Fiore Chapter 4 of The Path of Prosperity this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore The Path of Prosperity by James Allen Chapter 4 The Silent Power of Thought Controlling and Directing One's Forces The most powerful forces in the universe are the silent forces, and in accordance with the intensity of its power, does a force become beneficent when rightly directed and destructive when wrongly employed? This is a common knowledge in regard to the mechanical forces, such as steam, electricity, etc., but few have yet learned to apply this knowledge to the realm of mind, where the thought forces, most powerful of all, are continually being generated and sent forth as currents of salvation or destruction. At this stage of his evolution, man has entered into the possession of these forces, and the whole trend of his present advancement is their complete subjugation. All the wisdom possible to man on this material earth is to be found only in complete self-mastery, and the command, Love your enemies, resolves itself into an exultation to enter here and now into the possession of that sublime wisdom by taking hold of, mastering and transmuting those mind forces to which man is now slavishly subject and by which he is helplessly borne, like a straw on the stream, upon the currents of selfishness. 
the hebrew prophets with their perfect knowledge of the supreme law always related outward events to inward thought and associated national disaster or success with the thoughts and desires that dominated the nation at the time the knowledge of the causal power of thought is the basis of all their prophecies as it is the basis of all real wisdom and power national events are simply the working out of the psychic forces of the nation wars plagues and famines are the meeting and clashing of wrongly directed thought forces the culminating points at which destruction steps in as the agent of the law it is foolish to ascribe war to the influence of one man or to one body of men it is the crowning horror of national selfishness it is the silent and conquering thought forces which bring all things into manifestation the universe grew out of thought matter in its last analysis is found to be merely objectivized thought all men's accomplishments were first wrought out in thought and then objectivized the author the inventor the architect first builds up his work in thought and having perfected it in all its parts as a complete and harmonious whole upon the thought plane he then commences to materialize it to bring it down to the material or sense plane when the thought forces are directed in harmony with the overruling law they are upbuilding and preservative but when subverted they become disintegrating and self-destructive to adjust all your thoughts to a perfect and unswerving faith in the omnipotence and supremacy of good is to cooperate with that good and to realize within yourself the solution and destruction of all evil believe and ye shall live and here we have the true meaning of salvation salvation from the darkness and negation of evil by entering into and realizing the living light of the eternal good where there is fear worry anxiety doubt trouble chagrin or disappointment there is ignorance and lack of faith all these conditions of mind are the direct outcome of selfishness and are based upon an inherent belief in the power and supremacy of evil they therefore constitute practical atheism and to live in and become subject to these negative and soul-destroying conditions of mind is the only real atheism it is salvation from such conditions that the race needs and let no man boast of salvation whilst he is their helpless and obedient slave to fear or to worry is as sinful as to curse for how can one fear or worry if he intrinsically believes in the eternal justice the omnipotent good the boundless love to fear to worry to doubt is to deny to disbelieve it is from such states of mind that all weakness and failure proceed for they represent the annulling and disintegrating of the positive thought forces which would otherwise speed to their object with power and bring about their own beneficent results to overcome these negative conditions is to enter into a life of power is to cease to be a slave and to become a master and there is only one way by which they can be overcome and that is by steady and persistent growth in inward knowledge to mentally deny evil is not sufficient it must by daily practice be risen above and understood to mentally affirm the good is inadequate it must by unswerving endeavor be entered into and comprehended the intelligent practice of self-control quickly leads to a knowledge of one's interior thought forces and later on to the acquisition of that power by which they are rightly employed and directed in the measure that you master self that you control your mental forces instead of being controlled by them in just such measure will you master affairs and outward circumstances show me a man under whose touch everything crumbles away and who cannot retain success even when it is placed in his hands and i will show you a man who dwells continually in those conditions of mind 
which are the very negation of power. To be forever wallowing in the bogs of doubt, to be drawn continually into the quicksands of fear, or blown ceaselessly about by the winds of anxiety, is to be a slave, and to live the life of a slave, even though success and influence be forever knocking at your door, seeking for admittance. Such a man, being without faith and without self-government, is incapable of the right government of his affairs, and is a slave to circumstances, in reality a slave to himself. Such are taught by affliction, and ultimately pass from weakness to strength by the stress of bitter experience. Faith and purpose constitute the motive power of life. There is nothing that a strong faith and an unflinching purpose may not accomplish. By the daily exercise of silent faith, the thought forces are gathered together, and by the daily strengthening of silent purpose, those forces are directed toward the object of accomplishment. Whatever your position in life may be, before you can hope to enter into any measure of success, usefulness, and power, you must learn how to focus your thought forces by cultivating calmness and repose. It may be that you are a businessman, and you are suddenly confronted with some overwhelming difficulty or probable disaster. You grow fearful and anxious, and are at your wit's end. To persist in such a state of mind would be fatal, for when anxiety steps in, correct judgment passes out. Now if you will take advantage of a quiet hour or two in the early morning or at night, and go away to some solitary spot, or to some room in your house where you know you will be absolutely free from intrusion, and having seated yourself in an easy attitude, you forcibly direct your mind right away from the subject of anxiety, by dwelling upon something in your life that is pleasing and bliss-giving. A calm, reposeful strength will gradually steal into your mind, and your anxiety will pass away. Upon the instant that you find your mind reverting to the lower plane of worry, bring it back again, and re-establish it on the plane of peace and strength. When this is fully accomplished, you may then concentrate your whole mind upon the solution of your difficulty, and what was intricate and insurmountable to you in your hour of anxiety will be made plain and easy, and you will see, with that clear vision and perfect judgment which belong only to a calm and untroubled mind, the right course to pursue, and the proper end to be brought about. It may be that you will have to try day after day before you will be able to perfectly calm your mind, but if you persevere, you will certainly accomplish it, and the course which is presented to you in that hour of calmness must be carried out. Doubtless, when you are again involved in the business of the day, and worries again creep in, and begin to dominate you, you will begin to think that the course is a wrong or foolish one, but do not heed such suggestions. Be guided absolutely and entirely by the vision of calmness, and not by the shadows of anxiety. The hour of calmness is the hour of illumination and correct judgment. By such a course of mental discipline, the scattered thought forces are reunited and directed, like the rays of the searchlight, upon the problem at issue, with the result that it gives way before them. There is no difficulty, however great, but will yield before a calm and powerful concentration of thought, and no legitimate object but may be speedily actualized by the intelligent use and direction of one's soul forces. Not until you have gone deeply and searchingly into your inner nature and have overcome many enemies that lurk there can you have any approximate conception of the subtle power of thought of its inseparable relation to outward and material things, or of its magical potency, when rightly poised and directed, in readjusting and transforming the life conditions. Every thought you think is a force sent out, and in accordance with its nature and intensity, will go out to seek a lodgment in minds receptive to it, and will react upon yourself for good or evil. 
there is ceaseless reciprocity between mind and mind, and a continual interchange of thought forces. Selfish and disturbing thoughts are so many malignant and destructive forces, messengers of evil, sent out to stimulate and augment the evil in other minds, which in turn send them back upon you with added power. While thoughts that are calm, pure, and unselfish are so many angelic messengers sent out into the world with health, healing, and blessedness upon their wings, counteracting the evil forces, pouring the oil of joy upon the troubled waters of anxiety and sorrow, and restoring to broken hearts their heritage of immortality. Think good thoughts and they will quickly become actualized in your outward life in the form of good conditions. Control your soul forces, and you will be able to shape your outward 